Hello, and welcome to this evening's virtual event with Brookline Booksmith, featuring author Ellen Kushner for her book, The Golden Dreidel, in conversation with musician Michael McLaughlin. Now, some of you may know me already. My name is Rachel, and I'm a bookseller at Brookline Booksmith in Brookline, Massachusetts. If you're familiar with our store, welcome back. And if this is your first time with us, welcome. We're really happy to have you all here as part of our community tonight. And I so appreciate your support of an independent bookstore and authors by participating in events such as this and through your book purchases. Now tonight, we're so grateful to be hearing from Ellen and Michael. Musician Michael McLaughlin has been working in Boston's Jewish music world since 1994 when he joined the Shereem Klezmer Orchestra. As a noted composer, his works have been performed by the likes of the Newton Symphony and the Boston Chamber Ensemble, and he has won awards from the American Composers Forum Boston. Michael continues to work throughout the region with bands like Kleswoods and the Yaiko Miranda El Mele Quintet. When he's not playing Klezmer accordion, he is playing jazz piano with the Tall Tale Trio and lecturing in music classes at Tufts University. Now, author Ellen Kushner is a writer, live stage performer, radio host, teacher, and public speaker. She's the author of acclaimed works of literary fantasy, an award-winning audiobook narrator and stage performer, and the creator and former host of Public Radio's national series, Sound and Spirit, at WGBH in Boston. Ellen is also a co-founder and past president of the Interstitial Arts Foundation, which supports work that falls between genre categories, which is not surprising, given her own interest in defying category and classification in her creative work. Now tonight, we're very happy to be celebrating the beautifully illustrated edition of Ellen's middle grade novel, The Golden Dreidel, and to have the opportunity to hear Michael perform some accompanying music. You'll be hearing a little bit more about the collaboration at the start of this book, uh, later on in the conversation. Now, the golden dreidel follows its protagonist on a magical adventure that all begins with spinning an enormous golden dreidel. So it's a pleasure to hear both Michael and Ellen speak tonight. If you could please join me now in welcoming them, they can get started with the conversation. Yes, there's a spinning of a golden dreidel and the smashing of a television set which when I wrote this, TV wasn't as good as it is now, so I felt really positive about smashing a television set in this book. Thanks and hi, every Michael, thank you so much. I'm so excited Pleasure. that we can be together, even though I left Boston and live in New York City. Oh, you left me stranded. I know, man, but, but there's electricity. And I'm getting, we're getting all of these, th these highs from all over the country, which is another reason that, you know, electrical things are good. Uh, I'm not going to say hi to everybody, but I did notice that there is, we have two five-year-olds with us tonight, a five-year-old nephew and a five-year-old dog. I'm not going to, I don't know what that means, but we do. So it's really a party. I'm, I'm so happy that you're here. Um, I know, a, and so let's, let's just jump into the party um, and let me explain why we have music uh, tonight. It's not just because Michael's a nice guy and a gifted musician. It's because uh, before the five-year-olds were even born, in fact, before the 10-year-olds were even born, um, we got together and Michael and his band Shireem, led by our friend Glenn Dixon, um, had done this fabulous album where they just did a number on Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite and rearranged it as if it were Jewish party music, Jewish klezmer music. So uh, what am I talking about? Michael, would you like to play one of the pieces? that you guys did. Now, understand it was it with a full band and Michael is using his, how many keys does an accordion have? Well, 120 uh, keys in the bass, but uh, okay. yeah. He's using his 120 it's keys. Of, it's good enough, it's good enough. The question uh, is, can I, can I do it? All right, let's find out. And right. this, is, this is the original um, uh, production that we did together. So here we all are. This is a, an arrangement, Dance of the Dreidels. You might know it as Dance of the Re the Reed Flutes. <laughs> Thank you. 
you, that worked. You know, it was originally played by five musicians on different instruments, but you know, the accordion can conquer all. Thank you for working that up for tonight. That was really great. Thank and uh, lots of good comments about how fabulous you are, which do not surprise me in the least. So I meant to challenge you all and say, while you were listening to that, if you had to invent a story that had that piece of music in it, what part of the story or what story would it tell? I did give you some hand cues, right? And um, I'm gonna read you just a little section of the book in which the hand cues actually take place. So Sarah, our heroine, is a cranky little Jewish kid, remarkably like her author, who is sort of mad at everyone around the holidays and gets annoyed with her cousins at the family party and doesn't wanna play dreidel and doesn't want this and doesn't want that. And her mysterious Tanta Miriam brings a big golden dreidel and in this beautiful new edition of the book we have a fabulous image of Tanta Miriam coming in with the dreidel and says to Sarah this is for you and Sarah is a well brought up young girl and even though and she also <laughs> knows that if she doesn't say thank you she'll never get presents because someone explained it to her once so she glumly says thank you and um, then all the kids start getting rackety the way that they do. The television gets broken and they're all sent to bed without presents. But in the middle of the night, she creeps down very much like that girl Clara in that Nutcracker ballet thing that we've mostly seen. And the golden dreidel has turned into a dreidel princess and they go through the television set and suddenly they're in another world. Are you playing? The girl asked. She looked serious for once. She looked right into Sarah's eyes and her eyes were blue like the heart of a flame. Are you playing? Because if you're not playing, you have to get out. I'm not playing. She'd said it once already that night, but that was different. That was Seth and Amy and everyone being stupid to her. Here, she was all alone, except for her special gift, the golden dreidel that weird Tanta Miriam had pulled last out of the bag for her. I'm playing. Sarah said, what do I have to do? Spin, the girl said. But Sarah felt like it would just be so dumb. She hadn't spun around like that since she was a little kid. But I'm not a dreidel. Neither am I, the girl sang out. She stuck out her arms at both sides, like Seth and Sarah used to do when they were playing airplane. And the smell of the grass under her feet was the smell of long summer afternoons with nothing to do but turn around and around until the trees went round and round overhead. Sarah spun. Sarah spun and Sarah laughed. Her voice was loud and silly and the dreidel girl's voice joined hers like one bird in a tree calling to another that something good had come into their world. She spun until she had to fall down and she was laughing when the, she flopped down onto the sweet, sweet grass. How did you land? The girl asked, lying beside her. Um, Sarah looked down at her panting belly, but she didn't see any letters there. Those letters are on the toy dreidels. How can you tell? Practice, practice, practice. It sounded like one of those dopey jokes her father used to tell. No way, Sarah said. I don't think I'm cut out to be a dreidel. How did you land yourself? The girl looked down. Nun, she frowned. Nun means nothing. Let's try again. No more spinning. I want to do something different now. Let's go exploring or get something to eat or something. Does anyone else live here? Is this a magic world or just Europe or something? Are there vampires? Do you have to go to school? The dreidel girl was picking at some of the blood that had dried on her arm. Then she looked up into the distance. Do you like adventures? She asked. Mm, sometimes. What kind? Maybe one with Demons? It sounded like one of her brother's computer games. What kind of demons? The girl pointed with her chin toward the purple mountains. Off in the distance, a grayish cloud bristled with angry motion. The cloud was rushing closer and closer, so quickly that soon both girls could see the shape of huge beasts and hear the flap of wings. The weird thing was they looked backward. There was a lot of tails and hooves and things coming closer and closer. What is it? Sarah whispered. Demons. For the first time, the dreidel's girl's voice was tinged with fear. Hordes of them, an entire demon army. 
I thought they were still locked up in Solomon's cave. Sarah gulped. Well, they're not. What should we do? If they're on the march, it means only one thing. The demons have escaped, and we'd better run and warn the king. So they start running, but the demons are coming after them. And then, Michael, can you do that E section where it's da 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 and, and when I told the story with music, this is the point where I would say, all of a sudden, the dreidel started to spin. Sarah pulled from her hand, but a powerful force was pulling her away. Help me, Sarah, cried her friend. Now, I don't think I can speak over that. So just imagine that continuing as I read. Help me, Sarah, cried her friend. Sarah tried to hook her arm, but it slipped from her grasp as the dreidel turned faster and faster like a dancer doing a million pirouettes, but clumsy, not elegant, trying to resist. And she wasn't just spinning in circles. She was moving closer and closer to the terrible creature in whose hand pick up. She was moving closer and closer to the terrible creature whose hand was still raised, wielding an awful power. Oh, pause for illustration. The um, fabulous Demon King is here on the front page of the apprentice piece. Yes, if I were more technically uh, apt, I could have done like share pictures, but ah, I can't do that. Uh, so here we go. The terrible creature whose hand was still raised, wielding an awful power. The dreidel spun straight toward the demon king. With a cry of triumph, the demon surrounded her and caught her in a giant net. And so the adventure of rescuing the dreidel princess begins with many colorful characters, one of whom is the Queen of Sheba, who turns out to be the dreidel girl's mother, and sort of comes along and tells Sarah what's really going on. And there's a great picture of her here. And the Queen of Sheba fortunately has both food and camels. There's the picture of the Queen of Sheba offering Sarah food. This was the only place where the illustrator and I did not entirely agree because the illustrator put baguette here, like he put French food here. And of course the Queen of Sheba is offering her Middle Eastern food and it didn't make it into the illustrations, but you'll just have to picture it yourself. Um, and so once Sarah has eaten and gotten a much cooler outfit, which also didn't make it into the illustrations, the uh, queen says, why don't you get up on one of my camels and we'll go and you know, see if we can rescue her. So off she goes on the camel and it sounds like this. <laughs> In fact, I, I can hear my words reading over that music the way we did it in live performance. I expanded the script when I turned it into a book, and I'll read you the section that was the camel ride, including that little bit at the end, which is very abrupt, at which Sarah falls off her camel. 
Riding a camel was not as much fun as it looked. It was sort of uneven, like a car with a flat tire, and the leg Sarah had hooked over the saddle horn got awfully stiff. The view was good, though. They left the grasslands behind and soon were plodding through the desert. It seemed like hours since the queen's caravan passed through the beautiful land. That's not grammatical. Okay. Sarah was so tired she was afraid she'd fall off her camel. She tried to think of exciting things, but her head started to nod. She was dreaming of spinning dreidels. And the next thing she knew, boop, Sarah found herself sitting on the ground while the camels receded further and further into the distance. Hey, Sarah shouted, hey, I'm back here. But nobody turned around. They couldn't hear her. Soon the camels were just tiny specks. So the character she meets next is actually a tune that Michael can play for us. But first, I just want to talk a little bit about how this all worked out and came together. So originally, what happened was that um, the band and I were invited to do a performance for a festival in Boston, where I was living at the time. And I was on the radio then, so they thought I would be interesting to have. And then you I was a writer, too. So I listened to all this music and it didn't have a story. It was just the band kind of being clever about turning this music into a very different sounding music. Michael, do you remember, I think I remember Glenn, the band leader, saying that part of what it was was that the original Tchaikovsky dance suite all takes place in the second half of the ballet. And it's yeah. a bunch of people in international costumes coming out and dancing these kind of fake Russian 19th century theater international ethnic dances. Absolutely, that's what it is. Um, I don't know what to add to that, but yeah, the, 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 the suite is, there's probably maybe, a, well, those, those are, those are the, 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 I don't know, I don't know the technical thing, but those are the individual dances. And it's not much of a story going on at that point. All the story happens up front. Yeah, it's uh, actually zero story, in fact. Um, yeah. And so what happened was I was trying to think of, you know, what we were going to, I knew I wanted this to be basically like a Hanukkah version of the Nutcracker. And in the first half, obviously it's a party, the kids are playing, somebody mysterious comes in with a present, things get broken, and then she goes off to a strange land. And that was part one. So in part two, it's like, well, I don't know, in the ballet, um, there's all the, she gets to sit on a throne and watch all of these dances. And I remember very well you saying, no, you can't do that. I said that. <laughs> do you remember this? Oh, my God. I always quote this whenever I'm talking about it. You said, forgive me, um, um, parents of five-year-olds and others. You said, she can't do that. She's got to kick ass. She's got to have adventure. Oh, yeah, I'm sure I said that. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I listened to you, and so she now has adventures, and it was a lot more satisfying. Because I was trying to think, of like, oh, Ooh. other people will come in and tell stories and blah, blah, blah. No, it was much better letting Sarah, you know, have her own adventures. Thank you very much for your inspiration. It was um, about a journey. Yeah, yeah. But, but speaking of inspiration, what I thought was particularly cool about you guys taking these faux ethnic dances was that, in a way, you re-ethnicized them. Right, and that's even when we're when we're presenting it to the audience, we're always joking about that. Hence the the different names: Dance of the Dreidels, March of the Maccabees, which I just played, uh, Waltz of the Rugula. But but the point is, is that Glenn always sets it up that there was some deep ethnomusicological research to, to discover that you know the Nutcracker was originally a klezmer, a klezmer art form. <laughs> a klezmer, a klez, it was supposed to be whatever a klezmer ballet is how we how we say it. Um, and I gotta say, I think my favorite one in terms of you turning things upside down is the dance of the sugar plum fairy, which is, you know, we all know the dance of the sugar plum fairy. It's this delicate little thing. I remember going to a friend's house after school and I was just a little kid and it had the Celeste in it and it was just so delicate and fairy-like. And unfortunately, Michael cannot play it for us tonight because it involves a tuba. Huge. Well, yeah, it's a huge thing. Yeah. I, I didn't even look at that one. No. No, and quite wise. That However, is the waltz, that's the waltz of the Rugula. Um, okay. I think it sounds like a Rugula waltzing. <laughs> no, that's it. I, I think those, those, I just ignored your names for all those things because they were completely useless for creating this story. <laughs> you know, I went with, with what, um, 
with what did it, what does it sound like is happening at this particular time? And basically what we were doing was um, you had already written the, um, the uh, soundtrack to a story that I hadn't written yet. Yeah. So I know there are in some ways, it must be in some ways frustrating to hear us talking about something that um, is not in the book. So I fortunately dug out all, this, all the stuff we're talking about. The show that we did together got recorded and made into an album. And before that, it was the album that Michael and Shireen made that inspired this whole thing. I'm gonna post right now a link to my Substack. Thank you, Claire. I know you're listening. Claire told me to do a Substack, which is a kind of a newsletter that appears in your mailbox, but is also posted online on a blog. So if you want me to be the happiest Ellen of the year, um, subscribe to my Substack. And if you don't, just go to the Golden Dreidel um, post, which I <coughs> wrote rather late last night and sent out, and you'll see links to all of the music. You can hear it. You can know more about us. Yes, thank you, Carrie. Carrie says yay for Substack. Carrie's been trying to get me to do this for years as well. So, um, so that's the link. And please join my Substack, or at least go and find the links there. Here, we have a perfect opportunity to actually blend the words and the music. And I kind of like, so the creature she meets next, they're back, I, they, they came into my brain because I was listening to this music, which I would say is kind of the closest you come to actually capturing the mood of the original Tchaikovsky. Um, and I say that like it's a bad thing. Um, but it was an Arab dance. And I don't know, could you say that Klezmer has some relation to this music to begin with? Of Unlike course, the, the, there's, the, of course there's, there's a relationship to it. I mean, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of, lot of differences as well, of course. But, yeah. Um, but, yeah, but you'll listen I mean, and you'll hear it sounds less outrageous for this to be klezmer than for some of them to be klezmer. I, yeah, I didn't, I mean, even what I did is I used a, what we call in, in, in the klezmer world, a Turkisher, which is this. And that um, is a, a common rhythm um, in, all throughout the Balkans in Turkey, probably in the Levant region. Um, and so this one is actually was so I didn't even have to really do anything to this tune. All I had to do was put the Turkish do to it, and you know Tchaikovsky pretty much nailed nailed it already. And then when Glenn plays it, of course he does you know different articulations and so forth that make it more klezmer. Um, Glenn yeah, plays the was, uh, Glenn's the clarinetist. Yeah, Glenn's our clarinetist. He was the one who really. It was his big light bulb that went off. It's like, we must make the klezmer, I mean, excuse me, the nutcracker into a klezmer thing. Um, how are we doing this, Ellen? Am I playing while you talk? No, no, because we can't. I wish we could, yeah. but we can't. Okay. So fortunately, professionals have recorded us previously doing it, so that'll be fine. No, I just, I'm just going to challenge the audience. Like, the next thing that happens is that Sarah meets a creature. This is the music that inspired me to come up okay. with the creature and you know, run wild, run free. You don't have to guess what I guessed. What creature do you think you would meet if you had this music to go with it? You're muted, Ellen. 
I'll unmute. Yes, I am well aware of that, but <laughs> I couldn't get it to unmute. All right, so here's what I did. Um, she's falling off the camels. Camels are disappearing. She got up, rubbing her legs. You poor child, said a voice behind her. How you must be suffering. Da -dum, da -dum, da -da -dum. She turned and saw a bird. Well, not just any bird, a peacock, a glorious splash of color on the desert landscape. Its blues were bluer than a summer sky, and the green and gold of its tail feathers glowed like jewels at twilight. The peacock was talking to her. At home, birds didn't talk, except parrots, and they didn't know what they were saying, but this one did. You admire me, said the bird. Anyone would. It is very natural, and nothing made me to be ashamed. Nothing to be ashamed of. God made me to be admired. It's true. Everyone else in the world has their work to do. Even God, but I do not. God works, Sarah asked, distracted by the thought. Of course. In the beginning, God worked very hard to create the world. For six days and nights, the spirit breathed life into creation. Why else did the creator need to rest on the seventh day? So how come you don't work? Ah, the peacock inclined its lovely head modestly well. When God made all the animals and gave us our tasks, the living one, asked each of us what we would like. The horse asked for speed and strength to run. The leopard asked for clean smell and sharp claws to hunt. Then all the birds got started. The thrush wanted a sweet voice to soothe the heart. The chickens wanted lots of cute little eggs to lay. By the time they got to me, what was left? Creator of the universe, I said. You have made me according to your will. Isn't it enough that I be beautiful? God laughed and said, yes, that was enough if I thought it was. I don't like being laughed at, but after all, God, you know. Now, said the peacock, don't you think I made the right choice? Wouldn't you want to be just like me and Stand around, doing nothing but being admired. I used to have a great peacock puppet. It was huge, one of those huge folk peacock puppets. And when we did, when, when we did, you we could, it's, it's in the back room. I should have thought of it before. Um, we did a lot of uh, promotional things and I ended up taking the peacock with me to kids' schools. It was really fun. It was really fun to have the peacock. I had forgotten. We did a lot of stuff. Thank you, Brookline, for not letting the dream die. Percival. You want to get Percival the peacock? Okay, I'm, I'm home, so we'll get Percival, and Percival can say hi to you all. But, oh, this is great. I love people saying what they were seeing when they heard, when they heard the music. But anyway, it's peacock. Um, my favorite character in the whole book, I don't mind telling you, is the fool. Can you see him? He's on the other side of Sarah from the dreidel princess. And the fool is kind of a mishmash of Danny Kay and my dad's stories about being a kid in the Bronx and my uncle's, you know, sort of bad jokes from the, their childhood in the 40s. And I got very into riddles because uh, I love riddles and Tolkien in The Hobbit does riddles and I think they're just wonderful things for our brains. Oh, here comes oh. Oh, hang on, Percival's going to join us shortly. I don't know if Percival knows any riddles. Percival, do you know riddles? Can you say hi to the people? Say hi. Put your little head up. Hi. There he is. Yes, quite a magnificent peacock. I admire that peacock, don't you? So anyway, um, there's a bunch of riddles in the book. And in fact, the whole rescue of the dreidel princess rests on the riddle game. The problem is once I've asked you the riddles and then told you the answers, you know, you, you're already going to know the ending of the book, so, so we're not going to do that. Thank you. Yes, Percival wants to be. Okay, everyone loves Percival. Yes, do your thing. Beautiful. Yes, my, um, my partner Delia is, whoa, get out, whoa, get out, whoa. <laughs> yes, Percival gets a little overexcited sometimes, but thank you. She is the master puppeteer. Um, 
I guess everybody just, can you just put him on my shoulder? I'll sort of hold him on my shoulder because clearly he's a very popular. <laughs> <laughs> yes, here I am with Percival the Peacock. Yes, a splendid creature. And I could write him off my taxes because these things aren't cheap, you know. Um, <laughs> so I think that I'm, I can of course talk endlessly as you all know, but I would love to uh, answer some questions and I'm sure that Michael would too. So what have I not explained very well? Or what are you just wondering about? Um, while you're thinking of something, I'll tell you that um, between the time we first started doing the show and then we were touring the show and it became an album and oh, no, that became a radio special for the holidays and then it became an album. And it was, and I thought, oh, I should make a book of this. Oh, I don't know, I'm kind of busy. And then somebody from my publisher, Charles Bridge, came to me and said, we would love it if you made a book of this and you know all you have to do is ask uh so i did and it was a little bit longer than the original um story that i tell with michael and the band now i kind of wish i could do it over and make it even more complicated and longer but that is that the book came out in 2000 2002 i can't remember i think 2002 and then uh that was that you know it was done and then a couple of years ago Charles Bridge came back and said we want to do another edition with different illustrations and all of that we think the world is now ready for the golden dreidel and it turns out they're right and I'm really really pleased with this wonderful beautiful book and the fact that it's getting good reviews and that you're all here with me tonight to celebrate it well, looks like folks are already getting really excited to ask you some additional questions. I have some here wondering, first, will you ever get the group back together for more tours or live readings? I don't know. I'm not even sure why it stopped. Well, it the group just... is still together. Um, <laughs> um, I think we just stopped. I think I moved to New York and we stopped kind of pushing yeah. it because I would totally do it. It was a lot of work and I have to say the other reason that Michael's here is because I'm not really good at counting and there were times in the live performance where I had to come in on a certain beat and I never could get it right. Michael was playing, mostly plays the piano for the live performance and I would just be watching him and he would be like at the piano with his hand down by the keyboard and he would go and I would know that was my, I mean basically they gave up trying to expect me to count and, and I would get all my cues from Michael. So we became very close. <laughs> It's, it's, it's I would a, love no, to do I, it. Yeah, it'd be great. It would be fun to do it again. I think it has to do with just again uh, when the when the book you know when we first did it as a show and the book came out, there was a lot of energy behind it. Um, so you know, and I, as Ellen says, she moved to New York, and I think it also has to do with plain and simple things like you know there was I think an agent that would book occasionally that was doing some of these, and that stopped. So, but. <laughs> You know, you know if somebody right. out there wants to, you know, hire us, we'll come on out, you know, fly us actually to Arizona where it's nice and warm. We're ready to do it. Also, a lot of <laughs> arts, a lot of arts funding kind of went down the drain around that time. Yeah, exactly. We it used to, it used to be very easy for a community to both fly us somewhere, put us up in hotel and pay us. And then it became more difficult for them. That was part of it. So perhaps this is where I could plug. We, you know, as the band still does occasional concerts, and we're actually going to do a concert in the Worcester Museum on December 5th at 2 p.m. And we're going to play our the suite version. Ellen won't be there telling the story, but you can hear at least six of the songs from the suite. Um, we haven't played it for some years, but it's okay. We're all pretty good and we can nail it. So, <laughs> but it's, 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 it's exciting. They do, do rehearse. It. Yes, we do rehearse. It's getting exciting though to do it again. Cool. Well, cause, cause doing Hanukkah themed stuff is really a staple of a Klezmer band's um, yeah. year. So that's great. So Worcester, Massachusetts, what's the date? Worcester, uh, December 5th at 2 p.m. A matinee, the, the museum, the Worcester Art Museum. Wham. Wham. Do you want to find, do you have a link to put up in the comments? To uh, yeah, let me do that. I have it here. As you're posting that, I see someone mentioning that this should be an annual event. And I was, I was also thinking that, Lisa, I thought that that'd be pretty neat. 
or even at least like a victory, you know, coming out of the pandemic, finally being able to perform in person again event. Um, that would be great. No, so, absolutely. We do have another question here uh, over in our Q&A box, wondering, does Tant Miriam end up dancing with Sarah? perhaps with timbrels. In other words, does your character live up to her name and your story? <laughs> Very sharp question. In fact, she kind of does. And there's a big, so Tanta Miriam's secret identity is that she's actually the Miriam in the, um, you know, the Passover story and in the Bible who is the sister of Moses. And she's become a kind of an immortal auntie because um, I don't think she has, or has children in the Bible. She's just Moses's big sister, the one, in fact, who put the little baby in the water. And she helps him lead everybody out of Egypt. And when they've crossed the, the uh, Red Sea, she and all the women dance and sing and, and shake their timbrels. So it's this wonderful image of this woman. And she's also considered a prophetess. She works some magic during the course of all this. And a lot of people have reclaimed her as a a female, you know, great one in uh, Jewish tradition. So yeah, she uh, appears at the beginning of the book as an old lady, you know, wrapped in scarves, a wanderer with a big bag of treats. And uh, by the end, she has uh, manifested as something quite different by the end of the book. Looks like we've got another here wondering, did you revisit the E.T.A. Hoffman story when you wrote The Golden Dreidel, or is it mostly in dialogue with the ballet? I looked at the E.T.A. Hoffman a little bit, but I think mostly I was really focused on connecting, first of all, to the music. And, you know, there were, is it five pieces that are in the suite? There's six. Six. Six pieces, some of which we reused, of course. Because well, then, I, then we then we pulled more. When you came in the picture, then we pulled from the front end of the of, of the da of the ballet. So we were able to find a, there was a lot more music in the front that we were able to use as well. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to connect to the music, and I guess for me, you know, I didn't want to be so abstract. So the original story of the Nutcracker is, you know, is. Uh, 19th century, I think, story by E.T.A. Hoffman. It was in German. And it's not really where I felt I needed to go because the ballet is so much a part of our culture right now. And I was the jealous kid, you know? I was Sarah when I was a little girl because Christmas trees were gorgeous and glamorous. And I was told, no, you can't have that. Those, those are not for us. Those are for other people. And it was the same with, you know, basically all of mainstream culture was like super Christian Christmassy and you could watch but you couldn't participate and the big ballet that you got taken to you know in your fancy dress was all about somebody else's Christmas party and I just <laughs> wanted to own that stuff I wanted to own it and uh, to turn it into something that was ours and then of course uh, being an extremely serious woman I wanted to and a big fan of fantasy and Narnia and Wizard of Oz and all of that, I wanted to make my readers, Jewish or non-Jewish, feel that, that free soul of magic and of danger and of deep, the deep, deep myth that just gets right into your bones. And I wanted its origins to come out of, of Jewish tradition. I know I remember looking up the peacock and there's a lot of peacock folklore. Uh, of course, I never keep notes, so I forget where it all came from. But I would say that uh, just as in my adult novel, Thomas the Rhymer, which is based on Scottish folklore, pretty much everything in this book comes from some folklore or Talmud or biblical stuff. I mostly didn't make it up. See that some folks are commenting here, mentioning when I was a kid, it was my Jewish aunt who took me to the Nutcracker. So I just assumed that Clara was from a blended family like mine was. Oh, that's so cool. And in fact, I have blended families in here at the beginning. Um, I mean, it's very subtle, but, but not everybody has a Jewish last name. And there's a cousin, Amy. I just remembered this. In the original version of the book with the illustrations, I told, there were pictures of the kids at the party, which I think are not in this version, but I said, Amy's, Amy is an adopted Chinese daughter. So make sure that you, you show that in the pictures. 
It looks like we also have someone mentioning too that for those who are interested, there are Jewish aspects to the ballet. And there's a, a link here that folks can, can click on if interested. Thank you. And that comes from Jeff Nelson, who was my assistant on the radio program I was doing and was entirely responsible for finding all the most interesting and strange little tidbits uh, about just about everything that I had on the radio show, which was called Sound and Spirit and was a national program that was on for a good 10 years that I made with Jeff and a few other people and was the other reason that we were able to create the show and then tour it was that at the time people you know, knew who I was, had heard the show on the radio and loved the idea of it coming live to their town. I have, by the way, if you're not uh, familiar with it or if you wanna revisit some of the old shows, um, my assistant webmistress person, Randy Dawn, whose birthday is today, happy birthday, Randy, um, managed with the help of Jeff to put up um, some of the old uh, Sound and Spirit programs on my website. So go to ellenkushner.com and follow your instincts <laughs> to find the Sound and Spirit page. There's about eight of them up, and I think we're going to try and get some more up this year. It's wonderful. Um, you know, and hearing you talk a little bit about fantasy and how much of an interest that is for you, I wonder if you could maybe speak to some of the authors who are inspiring for you or some who you most enjoy reading. I know you mentioned, you know, the Talmud and folklore is a lot of what ends up making its way into your writing. Um, but if you wanted to mention some of that, I know you said Narnia and perhaps Wizard yeah. of Oz. Well, I mean, when I was a kid, it was the golden age of the first, the first wave of great children's fantasy, um, Narnia was huge for me. And just that sense that you could go to another land that had magic in it. And, and I mean, all children's books writers say that basically they're writing the book that they wanted as a kid. And C.S. Lewis talked a lot about, I'm, I'm gonna get it wrong because I can't remember exactly the words he used, but desiring it with a great desire. You know, you've got this soul, deep desire for, for magic and wonder. And he, and dragons, in Lewis's case, Delia reminds me. And I know that, I understand that. I felt that so deeply when I was a kid. And I basically wouldn't read any books that didn't have magic in them, um, unless they took place in the past. Frances Hogson Burnett was really important to me, A Little Princess and the secret garden, but I hated books that said, you know, the magic summer, and it turned out it was the magic of friendship. Freaking hated those. So I barely, they really had to twist my arm to get me to read the secret garden since, but at least it didn't claim to be magic, and therefore it is magic. Um, oh, thank you, Lisa Bell, who is a friend of mine when I was 12, reminds me that the Edward Eager books, which still are in print, those were huge for me. They're the best, they're about modern kids, who encounter magic based on the magic of the of the magic that kids encounter in the books from the last generation of mm -hmm. um, of E Nesbitt in England, and it's funny because the kids in Edward Eager are always saying, "Oh, this is like an E Nesbitt book." My library didn't have E Nesbitt books, so I absorbed it all through Edward Eager. Yeah, half magic and all of those were so great, and um, the Madeline Langle book, A Wrinkle in Time, also huge and then Tolkien, and then Le Guin, uh, A Wizard of Earth City. Uh, I wasn't a child by then anymore, but again, just that sense that you could go somewhere. And I would say that all great fantasy has foundational myths that people are drawing on. Um, Le Guin's is very much based on the Tao, and Tolkien was a very believing Catholic, and Lewis was a born again, you know, Anglican. And, you know, I, mean, I don't know that Le Guin practiced Taoism, but she understood the underpinnings of a deep myth. And all old traditions have very deep myths in them. And if you can, if that just is in your soul already and you can hook into it and bring it in, uh, you're going to have something a little extra in your book. I always feel like I failed in that in this. I wanted to do a sort of Jewish Narnia and I think I just wasn't quite up to it. When you're Jewish too, there's the problem that Judaism is kind of anti-magic. The folklore likes magic because all human beings like magic, especially in a pre-industrial society where you got nothing between you and, you know, 
death and illness. You don't know what's going on. So you invent demons because those at least you can fight. You don't know that microbes exist, so you can't fight them. But, but the religion traditionally is super rationalist. So it's harder to find. And, and the magic in Judaism is not appealing. You know, you read Isaac Bashev as singer, you don't want to be in that world. It's not a nice world. And I know that there are people now doing wonderful things, um, fantasies that have Jewish underpinnings, but they tend to be, well, I'm not quite articulate enough to say, and I haven't read enough of them, but it's, it's without twisting the stuff, it's, it's hard to make it as sparkly. Um, so that was a little bit of a challenge, but you know, an adventure is an adventure. And if you can set it somewhere that comes out of your heart and the things that you always have loved, um, that makes it something special. I like that thought. Looks like we've got a lot of remarks here. Um, someone's wondering if you've read Lucy Boston's Green No series. Yes, I'm a huge fan of Lucy Boston Green Nose series. I mean, I used to say that I was the only like Jew, I was the only Episcopalian who kept kosher because all those English children's books were just crack to me. I loved them, but I was always and remain very fierce and strong in not just my Jewish identity, but my Jewish, and not just my Jewish culture, but my Jewish spirituality. But it's a very human based spirituality. Uh, I was just reading something I can't remember what it was, but that said that with Jews, you can think whatever you want. Like you don't have bad thoughts that you have to repent. The only thing that you cannot do is behave badly. And that's all to do with how you treat your fellow humans. And that really is at the core of the religion. So it, it kind of lacks that magic that some of the other religions have. Because look, you know, Christianity, that the dying God is everything from uh, Tammuz in the Middle East to, uh, you know, Baldur here, here, here in the North, here in the frozen North. And uh, the, the Christianity and the Romans, in fact, I mean, Christianity was initially kind of made so that the Romans wouldn't be too scared of Judaism. And so it, it, it pulls in a lot more of the, the, the sort of sexy myth and magic. And boy, everybody's having best discussion over on chat. I love you so much. I should take another question. I know I'm seeing all these suggestions for books. Yes, The Dark is Rising, definitely. It's more, it's more Anglicanism. It's more Anglicanism. Nice. It's, and it's so freaking appealing, you know? And Merlin and all that stuff. I desire it. I desire it. And I, you know, hearing myself talk now, I'm like, I'm older, I'm more experienced. I have this book. I think, I don't think it's bad. I just don't think it hit those transcendent heights that I wanted it to hit. Um, and as I reread it, I realize that, that the deepest, strongest, best parts of it are all of the sort of 1940s American New York culture things. And I reread it and realized that and thought, you know, that's honorable. That's honorable. And it's not a world that, you know, our kids or our kids' kids have grown up in. I had three grandparents out of four that had accents because they'd come from elsewhere. And, you know, my nephews, all their grandparents were American born. So I kind of like, as that world maybe becomes farther and farther away, uh, it becomes more mythic. I wonder if, and I don't, I, don't, um, I don't know if you have any projects in the works that you'd like to talk about, but it does make me wonder if you've been thinking through some other stories where you might have those themes come back in, where you might tackle them again. I haven't for a while because, you know, nobody's asked me to, and I'm completing another novel that's from a very different part of my brain. At this book coming out really sort of took me by surprise. I thought, oh, well, they're reissuing it, big deal. But in fact, I think it's, it's having an impact that it didn't have the first time out. And that makes me feel like maybe there is still something useful for me to do. I, I realize this has been a very adult conversation 
thanks to anybody who brought a kid. If this were live, the room would be full of kids and I would have made a very different presentation. But as Fran Lebowitz says, it's the adults who have all the money. So buy the book for kids and then you read it to them and make it as fun as you possibly can. Um, one review pointed out that there are not a lot of Hanukkah middle grade books and it's, you know, it's got big type, but it's chapter book. Uh, but it's simple enough language and, and quick enough events that I think that it reads aloud okay to, to kids who are not reading. I do have, my most recent adult story is about Shakespeare and Marlowe, and it came out a few months ago in online, in Uncanny Magazine, and I'm just hit the uh, link for it if you want to read it. It's called Immortal Coil. I haven't done specifically for kids in a long time, and I always thought I would grow up to be a children's book writer. So. Who knows? The world is full of surprises. Boy, children's book writer and adult fiction writer amongst all of the other wonderful things that we mentioned at the start of this event. I mean, it's quite, quite an array. Um, I did want to mention to folks, we do have just a few minutes left. I cannot believe how quickly this has gone. Um, so if you do have any remaining questions, um, please feel free to pop them in our Q&A box or chat. I do see um, we've got one suggestion for Jewish Christmas Carol. I'm wondering about that. Has anybody done it? It seems so obvious. You should, you should that's a good idea. I'm just trying to read all the chats before, before mm -hmm. it all goes away. No one should mention it anywhere outside of this conversation. <laughs> well, I'm gonna click on that, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like we're more, it's more of a conversation than it is a question and answer. But do you have any more questions for Michael or me about what we did and how we did it and why? I'm seeing a lot of very happy comments at this point <laughs> and, and mentions that the five-year-old in the room did ultimately leave, but both my sisters and my mother are here now too. So it's a oh, 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 somebody, uh, there's an incredible, actually sort of Jewish magic realist book that I love that my friend Stu Heck mentioned. It's, this is an adult book, but I recommend it highly to everybody. It's called The River Midnight by Lillian Natel. And that actually was a grown-up book, uh, not about going to another world, but where I really felt that frisson of magic. And the other one is, um, which I actually edited until I quit and it didn't come out the way I wanted it to, but it's a marvelous book by Lisa Goldstein called The Red Magician. It actually won, a, I was in publishing once, I was her editor. Um, it actually won a National Book Award, and it's a Holocaust um, novel about a, a very Le Guin-like wizard who kind of wanders through the life of this girl who, in Hungary, who gets caught up in the Holocaust. It's gorgeous. The Red Magician and The River Midnight, neither of them a children's book, but for us adults who love this sort of thing, really strong. Somebody's saying Alchemist Door. I don't know that one. Cool, thank you. Like trying to jot all of these down. <laughs> these are all such great suggestions. Thank you everyone for sharing them. I um, love you guys. Thank you so much for coming. And I did want to mention too, for folks who haven't yet had a chance to get a copy of the book with a signed, and if you wish, personalized, thank you, Ellen, book plate, um, you can do so through the Eventbrite page where you registered um, through 9 a.m. tomorrow morning. So I'm going to pop that link here in the chat again um, for folks. But this was lovely. I so appreciate all of you coming out and being part of our community tonight with the Booksmith. And thank you so much again, Ellen and Michael, for taking time to chat with us. It was so much fun. Like you said, it was much more of a conversation, which I think is great. Um, and I hope you all take care. Thank you so much. So it's been recorded. Does that mean it's going to go up online? It should, yes. It takes a little bit of time. Um, if anyone's wondering, you can always reach out to us. We can try and update you as best we can. Um, but we, we do, as quickly as possible, work to get them up. Somebody's asking, does the bookstore ship? It does. We do, yes. Yes, if, um, you'll actually see an option specifically for shipping with, with purchase. Um, there's a pickup and a ship option on your Eventbrite page. Um, but you can also always call the store too. That's easier. Thank you for having us. This was just wonderful. Thank you. I so enjoyed. Take care, everybody. Have a great night.